then. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce our next speaker in this extraordinarily interesting mini conference, Professor Alan Hathens from Imperial College London. And is time travel possible? But you, you may have heard this talk before. Now, <laughs> Professor was an undergraduate at Cambridge. He studied theoretical physics, natural sciences, and he did his doctorate in astrophysics and shockwaves. And currently, he's working on cosmology with an emphasis on late cosmology. So, without further ado, Professor Edwards. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, my brief is to talk to you about time travel. I will give you a view of a physicist. I'm not a philosopher. Um, if there's anything that you violently object to, then please feel free to skip forward in time and get to the pub before the rest of us. Um, is time travel possible? Well, in my experience, it's inevitable. I have a 440 exam scripts on my desk, which I have to mark starting on Monday. And despite my best efforts, I'm getting closer in time towards it, and there seems to be no way to avoid having to do it. Um, let me start by talking about some of the things that we do know about time from a physics perspective. And uh, I'll start with the secure things and then move on to the progressively more speculative uh, things uh, as, we, as we proceed. Is it booming? Is that better? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, so things that we do know from special relativity, we know that time is not absolute. It runs at different rates according to the speeds of the uh, people involved. So if you imagine the situation of, uh, say, sitting in a DeLorean sports car and sending a light signal down from the roof to the bottom uh, and back again, uh, it would take a certain amount of time as viewed by somebody sitting in the car. Uh, if my PowerPoint skills were better, I would send it back up again, but you can <laughs> imagine that as well. But if you were to look from the outside perspective of um, somebody uh, standing on the road, if the, if the car is moving at high speed, then the path of the photon uh, would be uh, like this, uh, which involves a longer path length, and since we believe that the speed of light is constant, then it's going to take longer. So the amount of time uh, for the event to uh, to take place is uh, dependent on the speed of the observer. So it's quite possible for, to have two people who are moving through time at different rates. So uh, these uh, slides, are, some of these are going to be a bit darker, uh, I'm afraid, but uh, it's quite possible to have two, two people who uh, measure time, go and do something, come back together again and compare their clocks and then find that the, the times on their clocks are, uh, are different. And this is something that you can measure. The famous experiment is uh, the decay of muons uh, from the upper atmosphere through the atmosphere. The muon lifetime in the laboratory is 2.2 microseconds. So you can work out, if you were to ignore the effects of uh, relativity, uh, how many of the uh, muons that enter the top of the atmosphere should have decayed by the time that you get to uh, the measurement at the bottom. Uh, in special relativity, the time is dilated by an amount which depends on the speed of the objects. These uh, muons are traveling almost at the speed of light, so this dilation factor is very large. It's about a factor of five if the speed is 0.98 times the speed of light. So as far as they're concerned, the, uh, the muon lifetime is effectively uh, five times the 2.2 microseconds, so uh, there are fewer decays than, uh, than you would expect naively. And that fraction surviving is, is very uh, heavily dependent on this uh, time dilation factor. So the, the fraction that actually survives is about 5%, whereas if you ignored the time dilation effect, it would be some very small fraction of a percent. So there's something measurable that you can, you can do that would, uh, that would tell you that uh, time has been traveling at different rates. That's true in special relativity. In general relativity, uh, as we've heard earlier, there is also time dilation that uh, essentially comes from, in some sense, in the simple cases anyway, essentially conservation of energy, that if you have a photon which is uh, sent from the bottom of a tower, uh, in, uh, in this case in the uh, pound Ripker experiment, to the top, then the photon loses energy as it does work against the gravitational field. 
that loss of energy is manifested in the change of wavelength. So the wavelength uh, goes up and it's detected with a different, uh, different energy. So if you imagine these, the, the, the passage of the wavelength as being a tick of a clock, if you use it as an atomic clock, then the, uh, the tick rate uh, depends on the, where you are in the potential well of the Earth in this case. So these things happen together. Uh, you can combine them uh, in a famous experiment in 1971, flying an aeroplane around the world from east uh, to the east and to the west. You can uh, measure the differences in time, and there are gravitational effects that make 100 nanosecond type uh, changes and uh, special relativistic effects, which are of a similar similar magnitude. You can't necessarily distinguish the special and the general relativistic effects, they're somehow bundled together, but in these simple experiments then some sort of separation is, uh, is possible. So we know that time doesn't uh, occur at the same rates for different people and for different situations. Um, so it is possible for people to travel into the future for certain. Uh, this is the man who holds the record for having travelled the furthest into the future compared with the rest of us. This is Gennady Patalka, who very recently broke the record for moving into the future. He's been in space for approximately two and a half years. Uh, his clock has been going, again, a combination of special and general relativistic effects. His clock has been going at a slightly slower rate than the rest of us, and he's leapt forward into the future by 21 milliseconds. So this is something which is, again, it's something measurable. All you have to do is to do a wrinkle count and <laughs> compare him with his twin brother, if he had one on Earth, and just count the wrinkles. So there are measurable things that you can do to determine that actually something has, has, has changed. <clears throat> so these are the sort of normal things that you can do. You can mess around with the rate at which time travels. I think that's not quite what we mean, though, when we talk about time travel. So let's have a look at the possibilities of doing some arbitrary or semi-arbitrary jumps forward or backwards in, in time. Uh, so this is a picture of a black hole. It's on my screen. That's, from your point of view, it really is pretty black, but uh, um, looks really good on here. Um, so what are the characteristics of black holes? Well, why, why do we consider black holes at all? Well, these are regions uh, of space-time where space and time get uh, messed up quite considerably. The gravitational fields are very strong, unlike on the surface of the Earth. So these are the places where space-time gets uh, significantly distorted. So they're uh, a plausible place to look for very big changes to our normal concepts of space and time. Um, so let's have a look at some of the properties. Uh, the standard interpretation of a black hole is that there is a, in the, in, for, for non-rotating black holes, there is a spherical surface which is called the event horizon, through which light and matter can pass from outside to in, but not from inside to out. So anything that falls in cannot come out again. Um, and to a stationary outside observer, then time appear, appears to slow down as something approaches the event horizon. So if Einstein uh, were grey and he were to drop into the black hole, then from the outside perspective, as he approached the black hole, uh, the light that he was illuminating his uh, face would, uh, would lose energy uh, as it came away from the gravitational pull of the, of the, of the black hole and the light would get shifted towards longer wavelengths, so we would see him get progressively redder as time went on, and then that would, the light would get, uh, move very rapidly into the infrared, into radio wavelengths, longer and longer wavelengths, until it became uh, essentially invisible. Um, same sort of argument that if you take the passage of these light waves as a way to, uh, to define time, then the, uh, the time that we would perceive to have passed for, uh, uh, for Einstein would, uh, would slow down and come to a complete stop at the event horizon. So if we were to observe his watch, say, and look at the ticks of his watch, then from our perspective, the watch would uh, move more and more slowly as he approached the event horizon. We would never actually see him cross into the event horizon, through the event horizon, from our time perspective. Um, from his perspective, the picture is very different. Uh, from his perspective, nothing 
desperate may happen as he cro crosses the event horizon. Um, well, something desperate has happened in that he's now trapped and can't get out, but he may not know that. Um, and uh, he would fall into the centre in a, a finite time, as, as far as his uh, watch was concerned. To have a look at that in terms of space-time diagrams, we can have a look at uh, these uh, future light cones. So these are space-time diagrams where we suppress one of the spatial dimensions, time uh, goes uh, up the graph, and there are two spatial dimensions here. Light travels along cones, so the future uh, light cone is where the, a light signal would, would travel along here. A light signal that we received would have come in along the past light cone. And any material object with, with mass would have a world line, in other words, a passage through space-time, which uh, always stays within the future light cone. And if we look at the light cones in the vicinity of, uh, of a black hole, then if you're outside the event horizon, then these uh, are reasonably sensible. They get uh, distorted a little bit, but there are, once, as long as you're outside, then there is a possibility of a, of a photon uh, escaping to infinity. But once you cross the event horizon, then the light cones tip over, uh, and all point uh, inwards, and uh, there is uh, there is no escape. No, no light or any matter particle can uh, can escape, and you have to fall into the center. And here, time and space, in some sense, get get reversed. Uh, we're we're uh, we're used to the fact that in our experience, time goes goes forward. Here, there is no possibility of having your, the, your radial coordinate, your distance from the center increasing. You inevitably have to fall into the into the centre and to try to avoid falling into the centre is as futile as it is for me to avoid next Monday. It's going to happen. So there's a couple of strange things about the uh, uh, the metric of space-time in this uh, scenario. One is what what really happens on the on the event horizon that is singular in some sense in that uh, as far as our time, time coordinate is concerned from the outside, uh, nothing ever crosses it. You have to go to infinite time before anything crosses it. So it is singular in some sense, but it's, this is what's called a coordinate singularity. The, the, the coordinates which are used here, which are simply labels for events, four numbers for each event, um, they're designed for a particular purpose and they're not particularly well designed for an observer that is uh, uh, that is falling into the black hole. So you can you can define different sets of coordinates for which this singularity uh, doesn't occur as a singularity, such as the time that's elapsed on the watch of Einstein as he falls in. The spatial the spatial origin at the center, in general relativity, really is singular. There's no way out of that. If you look at the curvature of the universe at that point, in space-time at that point, then it, it, it really is infinite. Uh, GR is general relativity is a classical theory and that may, get, may well get modified in a, a quantum theory of gravity. But these singularities are rather different. One of them is, a, in a sense, a real singularity and the other one is, uh, is not. So, earlier on was uh, mentioned the, uh, uh, the gravitational waves. Um, and uh, that's relevant for this story because if we're going to try to use the space-time around black holes to, um, uh, to, to uh, use for, for time travel, then we could check if we, are, uh, if, if we really understand the, uh, the, the space-time near a black hole. So what we expect is if we have two coalescing black holes is that as they merge together, they uh, send out gravitational waves, the effect of which on the Earth is to move it around in this strange way. It doesn't move the Earth up and down, but it makes it wobble like a jelly, with an amplitude which is somewhat smaller than is shown in this, in this diagram. And these, as you know, were famously detected in September of last year, having set off something like 1.3 uh, billion years ago by LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, uh, which detected the relative motion, the relative motion of, of uh, parts of the experiment at the end of uh, long, four kilometer long uh, arms. This one is in uh, Livingston, the other one is in Hanford in, uh, in Washington. So I don't know whether you're going to be able to see this, but this is basically, whoops, I think I have to do them here. 
Uh, it's a Michelson-Morley experiment, essentially, uh, where uh, you set things up so that the light beams which pass through a beam splitter here and uh, then go to mirrors at the other end, at each end of the arms, uh, they come together and they destructively inter interfere. And uh, so you get no light appearing off to the right-hand side when they recombine. Um, but if a gravitational wave passes by, then that changes the relative positions of the mirrors at the end. Uh, and that changes the path lengths so that rather than cancelling out the waves, one being up when the other one is down, the change in the path length will mean that that cancellation is no longer perfect and you get some light that is received at this end. It's an extremely difficult um, experiment to do. It's amazing that they've done it. Uh, the movements of the uh, mirrors are uh, less than the radius of a proton. To give you an idea of the small size of this, if you uh, ask by how much has the, uh, so the, 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 the distortion is what's called a strain, so distances get multiplied by the same factor. So if you have uh, mirrors which are twice as far apart, they will move by twice as much. Uh, if you ask how much has the distance between the sun and the next nearest star changed during the passage of this uh, of this wave, uh, they're about four light years apart, and they changed by the width of a human hair during the passage of this thing. So it's an incredibly impressive experiment. So um, what do you expect to see from the coalescence of two black holes? Well, they will spiral in together, radiating away gravitational waves, which loses energy. Uh, so they spiral in and eventually merge together into a single black hole. And this is theoretically what you expect to see. Um, and this is the event where the two uh, black holes come inside and then they sort of wobble around for a bit and then settle down. And this is what was observed. This is the two signals from the uh, Hanford experiment and from the Livingston experiment. They're a little bit noisy, but you see that they, they look uh, uh, pretty similar to uh, what you expect from here. And uh, you've got two, two independent experiments here. Uh, if you put them together, you have to flip one of them upside down because of just the orientation of the detectors. Uh, but they sit on top of each other. So this sort of coincidence uh, of the signals tells you that it's not, you know, it's not something else that's caused this, uh, um, you know, some, some uh, cow landing near to the, you know, the mirror at one end of one of the experiments. So it's a beautiful result, and uh, this is, oops, uh, this is just a computer simulation, which uh, this, is, this sort of thing has only been possible recently with supercomputers to, to make the predictions for what you would expect to see. So the colors tell you the rate at which time is uh, flowing, the shape tells you the distortion of space-time, and the uh, arrows tell you the, where things uh, move to. So here, here are two black holes. You may or may not be able to see them merge into, uh, into one. So what's the importance of this? Well, the importance of this is as uh, one of the main predictions of general relativity, it's, uh, uh, it's um, passed with flying colours. Um, but the important point for our purposes is that it tells us that I think we do understand space-time space in very strong gravitational fields. And this is the only experiment that's been done, uh, that's been repeatable, that has really tested general relativity uh, very close to black holes. There are other tests of general relativity, but the smallest distance you can see the gravitational waves going out here the smallest distance that GR has been thoroughly tested at in terms of the radius of the event horizon is some tens of thousands of the times the, the uh, radius of the event horizon so so this is the first real uh, stringent test of space time in, in um, strong fields so so we think that we understand space time around black holes so let's uh, now get somewhat more speculative. All of what I've told you has been what's happening outside the event horizon. Um, one way to look at it is that we have the universe that's accessible to us, which is out here. There's the horizon, the event horizon. An observer can pass into the black hole and then reaches the singularity, which in this Penrose diagram is at the, uh, the giant <coughs> land on the top. So, so far, so good. but. The so-called Schwarzschild solution, which describes the mathematics of this, is, uh, is not complete. And there are other mathematical possibilities for this space-time. 
Uh, one of which is that there is a, uh, a white hole solution where things, which has no horizon, where things can come uh, out, no horizon going outwards, where, where the uh, things can uh, come out of the object uh, and, uh, and not go in. So uh, this is an interesting possibility because um, it uh, led to the idea that perhaps you could marry these two up and have a black hole entering a black hole and then coming out somewhere else uh, in uh, as a white hole. So these non-rotating black holes are not very good for time travel because if you could do it at all you'd have to go through the singularity in the middle which is an unpleasant place to be. But there are other types of uh, black holes which um, are possible. Uh, so this doesn't show up very well but there's uh, uh, rotating black holes described by the Kerr metric uh, which is shown here. Uh, have some interesting surfaces in them. It's a more complicated space-time structure. Uh, so you'll notice the appearance in the equation of this uh, Greek delta letter, uh, which depends on the radius in this way. So the, these black holes are characterized by a mass m and also a spin, which is, uh, which is a. And uh, there are some places, some locations, where this term delta is zero. So since it's on the bottom, that corresponds to uh, some sort of singularity. Uh, it's a quadratic equation, so there are two solutions to this. There are two radii where delta is zero, and these correspond to horizons. There's an outer horizon and an inner horizon. Uh, they, they're coordinate singularities, so a different coordinate system will say that you can pass through them without any, uh, any difficulty. But the interesting thing about these uh, objects is that the singularity is not a point in the center, but if you use a different coordinate system, you find that the, the, the place which is really singular, where the curvature becomes infinite and you really cannot survive, is a ring. Um, and that gives the possibility of actually uh, entering and going through the ring without having gone through uh, a really singular place, uh, which will destroy you through tidal forces. Um, so what you can do mathematically, whether this happens in practice, personally I doubt, but uh, mathematically you can match on uh, a solution like this to a similar white hole type solution where you uh, you match up the top surface of the of the disk here with the uh, lower surface of, uh, uh, of a space time which has r less than zero uh, which allows you to get out to somewhere else in the same universe or into another parallel universe or somewhere else these things will not occur from the collapse of ordinary objects like stars so if these things are going to work at all, they have to be produced in some other way, um, perhaps pre-existing black holes that uh, uh, existed uh, before the universe started, if that makes any sense. And in fact, if you demand that uh, the world lines, the passage through space-time of any object that doesn't end up in a really singular place, if you demand that those those world lines uh, continue, that they don't stop, then in a sense you're driven to having infinite copies of the space-time of the Kerr metric, uh, where you can move in and out of uh, uh, black holes and white holes in uh, a fairly complicated way. So this concept is uh, effectively a wormhole where uh, you can emerge somewhere else, so if we represent the universe by this two-dimensional sheet which has been bent round, uh, if you have a a, a black hole and enter here and then emerge somewhere else in the same universe or as I say possibly in another universe if that means anything then uh, you have the possibility of having some time travel. Now I'll say how that works in a moment but uh, this is quite difficult to do because this wormhole tends to pinch off and uh, destroy itself and you need to have some matter with a very strange equation of state in order to keep the wormhole open so referred to as exotic matter with a negative energy density. It's whether you can actually make stuff with uh, uh, negative energy density that persists for any length of time is, um, I think, not certain. It's, it tends to be extremely unstable. Uh, there are some claims that it could at least exist for, uh, for a short time through quantum fluctuations. So you, if you have one of these things and you can keep the, the wormhole open, then you can turn it into a time machine. So one simple way to do this would be to 
uh, create one of these things, take the white hole on a relativistic journey or close to a black hole, in either case where time is traveling slowly, uh, and then you bring it back to where you started or close to where you started. Uh, so the black hole has maybe taken from 2000 to 2016, whereas the white hole that's been on the journey has been, tra uh, time has been passing at a slower rate, so it's only perhaps got to 2008. So now you have a white hole and a black hole which are physically close together, and if you were to nip into the black hole, emerge at the white hole eight years earlier, you could then take the very short trip back to where you started, so you'd be back where you were in 2008 plus however long it took the bus to get you around from one to the other. <clears throat> other ways to do this are to go into extra dimensions, that's another possibility without the need for exotic matter. We look for the evidence for external uh, extra dimensions by looking at uh, the bending of light, which uh, whose properties change if you have extra dimensions. That's something that we can measurements that we can make within our own four-dimensional universe uh, to determine whether such things exist. No evidence so far. Um, so that's one possibility to, for time for time travel using using wormholes. Another possibility is which exists in general relativity. So general relativity has no notion of time being forwards or backwards. So there is some, uh, there are solutions in general relativity for sure, uh, where you get what are called closed time-like curves, CTCs. Um, we know that rotation will drag inertial frames around, so-called lens steering effect, which tips the light cones over. And if you have really extreme metrics uh, the first of which was discovered in 1937, uh, which where you have enough rotation, then these light cones can tip over uh, to the extent that, uh, that you can basically traverse round uh, and get back to where you started in time and have a, a world line that rather than moving inexorably up the page, uh, ends up uh, going in a, 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 closed, a closed loop. So the Kerr metric for a rotating black hole has such closed time-like curves. Um, they exist, you can't really see them very well here, but they, this is the ring singularity seen edge on, and there are closed time-like curves that come uh, in, this, uh, in this region here. Um, some relativists don't consider this region inside the inner horizon because it's notoriously unstable, so it may, this may not be a good description of the space-time inside, but if we just run with it and say, let's uh, take the mathematics as red, ignore instabilities, then uh, these closed time-like curves uh, exist. Uh, the problem, as far as we're concerned for observing it, is that the, uh, the curve is, at least part of it, is inside the inner horizon which means that whatever's going on in there, we have no possibility of, of, of observing it. So if there are people who are moving backwards in time in this, uh, in this scenario, then we would never know. So who is the observer? Um, what we do know is that the real objects will not have this structure that we saw before of the repeating uh, Kerr metric of the black holes and the white holes. What's not clear at the moment is whether a real object would destroy the closed time-like curves here. That's an open question about whether if you tried to make a, uh, a Kerr metric from the collapse of a star or the matter at the center of a galaxy, say, then would that actually destroy the, uh, the closed time-like curves? Uh, as far as I'm aware, that's, uh, that's not known. But, as I say, this inner space is extremely unstable, so if it's, um, it, 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 it's probably unlikely that these things do, uh, do survive. Uh, let's assume that you can do this. Um, just a quick remark that uh, it does lead to logical problems such as the grandfather paradox. I never understood why it's called the grandfather paradox. Why not the father paradox? But, um, uh, so it seems that... <laughs> Um, so one possibility is to accept the many worlds interpretation and say that if you go back and kill your grandfather, 
so that you no longer exist, that the universe splits into two, one of which, one of which you exist and one of which uh, you do not. So this is illustrated by Doc Brown very effectively in Back to the Future. Okay, so let me just finish by um, just talking about some of the several ways that you could uh, prevent time travel in this. I've sort of hinted at some of them. Um, one is that this is not necessarily a way to prevent the time travel, but all of the those time light curves pass through an event horizon. So if they do exist, then they are in parts of the space-time that uh, we are, do not see. With any violation of causality is not accessible to us uh, as an observer. Um, there's also some work that goes way back to Novikov on the so-called self-consistency conjecture that uh, wants to avoid any logical inconsistencies that come uh, from things like the grandfather paradox. And uh, Hawking said many years ago that it seems that there is a chronology protection agency which prevents the appearance of closed time-like curves and so makes the universe safe for historians. In terms of physics, how would this be achieved? Well, this is all highly speculative. Um, uh, there is some work on where you combine quantum theory with curved spaces, um, space times, uh, so called semi classical gravity, which is not a full theory of quantum gravity, but you try to go some way to uh, incorporating both, uh, both theories. Uh, and in semi classical gravity, then uh, it seems that vacuum fluctuations uh, grow uncontrollably as soon as a closed time like curve uh, uh, emerges. Uh, producing energy densities and stress energy tensors which are, which are divergent and which would then uh, disrupt the space-time, uh, presumably uh, destroying the closed time-like curve in its, uh, uh, as it does it. Um, so it seems increasingly unlikely that this is going to be something that, uh, that can work. Uh, the one get-out is that we don't have a workable theory of quantum gravity uh, yet. Um, so the attempts that try to combine the two are not, they're not complete yet, so uh, it's still an open possibility that a, a full theory of quantum gravity, um, although string, so there are some indications from string theory that, uh, the, um, that the chronology protection seems to, seems to work in string theory, so uh, there is still some possibility uh, of having uh, time like uh, time travel. It's, it's looking, from my perspective, as, that it's increasingly untenable, but at the moment it's not completely ruled out. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much for a fantastic, fascinating talk. Any questions? Your um, singularities you talked about, you talked about, was it, I can't remember the term, you talked about real singularity. Is it geometric singularity or? Uh, so the coordinate singularity, right. Can you explain, so I didn't quite catch the difference between the two. So, um, so coordinate singularities often arise because you haven't chosen perhaps the best coordinate system to describe events in your space time. So even, there are strange things that happen even using, say, latitude and longitude on the surface of the Earth. And if you go to the North Pole and ask, what is the longitude of the North Pole? Well, actually, every line of longitude goes through it. So what, what, what is it? So that's a, that's a slightly odd point. Um, but you could easily avoid that by, say, just redefining where the pole is. So there's nothing particularly weird in the geometry at the North Pole. Uh, so those sorts of singularities are not ones that we particularly worry about remove them by choosing a different way to label <coughs> points in space-time. Uh, the ones that one should be concerned about are ones where you get something um, uh, that is, is called <coughs> independent. So, um, so one, of the, one of the measurements that we can make is the, um, uh, is the, is the curvature scalar. So there's a single number which everybody would agree on. It's a coordinate independent number uh, and ask what is that value at a particular point in space time. Now if that's infinite then you're in trouble. So the, the tidal forces for example at the centre of a 
uh, a non-rotating black hole would tend to infinity, so you would get stretched out. And that's a statement which it doesn't matter what coordinate system you use, that is, that is going to be. So we're all singularities in real terms, singularities. If you're facing the right in front of you, other singularities. Uh, so infinitely dense, infinitely small object. Uh, so no, it depends what kind of singularity they, they are. So, so the one that appears at the event horizon, from our point of view, it looks singular. From the point of view of somebody falling in through it, yeah, they could survive. If it's a, they have a big tidal force. If you if you try to go into a black hole of a few solar masses, then the tidal force is the same as if you uh, if, if you um, hung from the Eiffel Tower and you've got the, all of the population of Paris to hang onto your feet. Yes, that's the that's the tidal force. So it's quite a lot. But bigger black holes are easier to get into. Yes, yeah, so yeah. Thank you. We have a question. Uh, so this question relates to special relativity. Um, my understanding is that uh, the speed of light is uh, the same no matter how one is moving relative to it. Um, and really the question is, I mean, is my understanding correct? Because it seems uh, non-intuitive. Because we, we normally think of photons being like little particles. So if they're coming from the sun to us, um, if we are moving towards the sun at half the speed of light, does the speed of those photons still equal the speed of light? And if we're moving away from the sun at the speed, half the speed of light, are the photons still appearing to be coming past us at the speed of light? Yes. <laughs> but it's sort of counterintuitive. It, it is counterintuitive, absolutely. Yes. But the experimental evidence is, is, is there from the Michelson Morley experiment onwards. Um, so it is completely counterintuitive, but experimental tells you. I've heard it said that it's possible there's only one electron and it's bouncing back and forth at the time. Is it, everything you said, does it apply to subatomic particles? Do they be traveling back and forth in time all the time? Or? Uh, that's a good question. I don't think I know the answer to that. Um, I'm not secure enough in my quantum physics to know whether what a description of particle antiparticle pair creation would be. I don't know if anybody else is. So you can see that an antiparticle is a particle that's traveling back to the yeah, Okay, that's the definition of an antiparticle. Okay. Well, so how that would apply to the whole universe, I think, is still a completely open question. I mean, you're quite right that the level of particle field theory. But to what extent that's a, a possible way of thinking about what's happening in the whole universe, I think, it is a question until we have quantum gravity. True, and make measurements in the laboratory where there is no quantum gravity. It's quite classic. Mm -hmm. Oh, this question and another question. I was, I was interested in the sort of nuance of experiencing time in a different way. Um, so would it be for the photons that travel at the speed of light that they do not experience in inverted commas time at all, but for them the universe has just begun, so to speak? Does that make any sense at all? What, what is it? Yeah, I don't know if it makes any sense. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, as I think Bobby mentioned this morning, you know, in some sense no time passes, but uh, since... What do you mean by... I mean, normally what you mean by time is that if you have... If you're sitting on a particle and you have a watch that's attached to the particle, you measure the time that's passed on the watch, then that has some meaning. But the thing is, you can't attach a, a watch to a photon because you can't get it to travel at the speed of light. So, uh, so I don't know whether it makes sense. I don't know whether you want to. Yeah. Can I say something else? Yes. Yeah. Good thing. That very counterintuitive thing about the photons going still just as fast as they go, as they come past you if you're going away from the sun. Of course, there is the effect of aberration, which is very pronounced. As you, in this universe, as you approach the speed of light, all of the stars in the direction, all the stars seem to be moving around in front of you. They all move around towards you. So there is a very profound effect that you observe 
because of that. Uh, uh, in this universe, we will see them all in front of us if we start moving relative to the stars at near the speed of light. And that's a very profound effect. There's a question here. Yeah. I'm wondering whether there's any escape for somebody who's in a close time curve, mm. or is that the physicist's version of heaven or hell? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. Well, I think, uh, I think these, um, there may be, I think, you know, go ahead. <coughs> they're not necessarily, um, let's see, uh, yeah, I think you, you, you do have the possibility of having additional accelerations that would take you away. They're not necessarily GD6, I think, in, in any case. So I think you, you maybe need to provide some you know, fuel to keep you in there anyway. Um, but yes, I, think, I don't think they're, I don't think they're necessarily ones that you can never get out of. On that topic, if I could take the privilege of asking, could you reverse the process and construct a time machine with CTCs? Uh, yes, you can. Yes, because you do end up you do end up going back to where you started. So, uh, you know, this. So you, you could do it in a laboratory. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> the laboratory was inside the back hole. Mm -hmm. Uh, you probably don't want to be there. Don't you? <laughs> Another question. Well, this this might be a banal observation, but just about uh, whether being on a closed time like curve is heaven or hell. You of course only go around once. Your if, if, if your life is a closed time like curve, then there are various stages of your life at each point on the closed time like curve. But it's not like you keep cycling around uh, forever. It's an interesting question yeah. to discuss over a beer. Right? <laughs> <laughs> what happens if the particle evaporates from the black hole? It's not closed curve. Actually, I've got another question, comment, actually. Uh, if we're thinking of, of photons in terms of particles, um, I would think we can't actually measure the speed of a photon because, uh, you know, if we were measuring it when it's come past one point and reached another point, uh, we would probably have to destroy it to measure it, if you see what I'm saying. You know, if we want to, we've got a photon coming along and it arrives at point A, and then we want to say, well, when does it arrive at point B? When we try to measure it, we don't destroy it, mm -hmm. I think. So you mentioned the Mitchell's and Morley experiment. I mean, maybe that works in terms of looking at light as a wave form, but not as a particle, possibly. So presumably, this, if that were an objection, you, you could have a bunch of photons, some of which were recorded and some of which were not. Well, well, I don't think so. <laughs> because, I mean, basically, I mean, the way we normally measure the speed of something is we observe it at one point and then at a certain time later it's at another point. But we can't do that with an individual photon as a particle. You could create it and then destroy it. Sorry? You could create it at one point and then destroy it somewhere else. You record both of those events. There might be a bit of a time delay between it being recreated, but anyway. So the other end far enough away. <laughs> Just like an amplification question, I'm having trouble understanding how you would harness the CTC to go back in time. Can you explain? So, yeah, further to your question about, you know, computing from the laboratory. Can you explain how that would um, So... <coughs> So I think if you if you if you if you pass around the the, um, the curve, then as, as far as your clock is concerned, I think your clock is still ticking. So there is still a, a you know a time which is which is passing, but you end up back where you. I'd have to think about that. I'm not sure exactly how it would how it would work. Whether you could uh, uh, do something in the same way that former colleagues did with the um, with the time machine from from Wormholes. 
uh, to, to, to make a specific mechanism that I have to think about. There is a question. Yeah, I just wanted to make a remark coming back to this counterintuitive feature that the speed of light seems to be the same for all observers independent of their motion. <coughs> Einstein in 1905 realized that there was all lots of good evidence for the claim that measuring the speed of light with respect to the Earth, for example, the speed of light was always the same independent of the speed of the source. And this is exactly what you would expect of light as a wave phenomenon because it's a disturbance running through a medium and the velocity of the Disturbance will depend on the elastic properties of the medium, not the speed of the source. So that's a very natural thing if you think that light is a, is a wave. Now you mentioned <clears throat> that if you think of it as a, as a particle, you might not have that, that idea, but Einstein already knew that light was a particle in 1905. So he did something very, very remarkable. He speculated that from the point of view of its velocity behavior, it acts more like a wave, even though he knew it was a particle. So then what he did was to say, well, if it's a, a constant value with respect to the surface of the Earth, in other words, to my inertial frame, it should be the same for all inertial frames, because this is the relativity principle. That's a speculation. And then it turns out that the speed of light is the same for all observers. And that seems very odd. But then he turned around and said, and here's what must happen for you to explain this. If you're, if you're looking at a light ray, and you're measuring it to be speed of c. Well, actually, you can't measure the one-way speed. Directly, you really are measuring the two-way speed, but putting that, that issue aside. The reason that a moving observer, according to you, is seeing the speed of, is being the speed of light at the same speed, is because her rods and clocks are doing funny things. The rods are contracting and the clocks are dilating. That's why they're seeing this strange effect. But of course, the other observer can look at you and say, wait a minute, I'm the one who sees the speed of light as C. You only see C because your rods and clocks are, contra are contracting and dilating. And that's just the way it is, folks. Everybody accuses the others of having bad measuring devices, and everyone is right. <laughs> and incidentally, I just wanted to mention that the first experiment that tested for the invariance of the speed of light. It's not the Michelson-Morley experiment, it was the kennedy Thorndike experiment, which was some years later. The Michelson-Morley experiment simply showed you that the two-way speed of light was the same in all directions. But it didn't tell you it was the same across inertial frames. So there's very good evidence, and nowadays everyone accepts that the speed of light is invariant, no matter how counterintuitive it seems at first time. I saw a recent theory that suggested that in black holes the uh, matter's not destroyed, it bounces. But the reason you don't see the bounce is a time dilation effect. It, it's way forward in the future. Right? Do, do you know anything about this? Bounces? Yeah. Hmm. I think we don't know what happens at the very centre because it's in, uh, in GR, it's a classical theory that there's a point in GR that has to be a, a uh, that becomes an infinite density point, I suppose, if you, uh, if you were to try and measure it. But, so, how that will get changed in a quantum theory of gravity, um, who knows? It's an open question. Oh, Newtonian three-body problem where 
all three particles can collide at once at their common center of mass. But in fact, actually, if you just look at the shape, it can go through perfectly happily without anything happening. So it's quite interesting if you take out that scale, which is not directly observable, then actually perhaps nothing untoward happens. If you just look at the shape, it might be perfectly okay. It's not to say that there isn't a special point there, but it's, but it's not one that's causing the shape to be destroyed. So let's thank our speaker and actually all speakers for this afternoon session. Thank you very much for